Before we begin, I would just like to cover a few housekeeping items. All webinars will be recorded and posted on our website in the coming weeks. The chat function is enabled for questions, so please feel free to submit them throughout the webinar. We will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible, covering a good range. Uh, the chat function can be found at the top of your screen, and this webinar is in listen-only mode, so all participants are muted except for our panellists. Closed captions are available and can be enabled by clicking the CC icon at the bottom right of your screen. If you experience any issues, please refer to the frequently asked questions posted in the chat or contact our NAPCAN support team at 0280733300 and a team member will assist you. Alternatively, you can email contact at napcan.org.au for any further questions or concerns. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this important discussion about the intersection of the rise of digital technology and child prevention and protection efforts. I'm Harrison James, I'm co-founder of the Your Reference Ain't Relevant campaign, and I've had the distinct privilege of working with advocates and survivors across Australia to push for legislative reform that better protects our children within the legal system. Today's conversation is incredibly close to my heart as a survivor of child sexual abuse, I am acutely aware that this conversation will speak to the power we all have to make a difference in protecting young people in an ever-evolving digital world. As National Child Protection Week draws to a close, I'm honoured to be here with you and excited for the insights we'll share together on such a relevant and nuanced topic. Uh, although I'm joining from Italy today, I uh, wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the majority of us here today are gathering virtually. And I pay my deepest respect to the traditional custodians of the land, to the elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. It always was, and it always will be Aboriginal land. We're here today to explore how artificial intelligence can play a vital role in safeguarding young people online, particularly in preventing cyberbullying grooming and exploitation. However, as technology advances, new challenges arise, such as in the increasing prevalence of deep fakes, which we'll also address in this session. Our aim is not only to raise awareness about the intersection of digital technology and child protection, but to also bring fresh voices into this critical conversation. Many of you share our commitment to developing ethical guidelines to ensure that AI and other digital tools are used responsibly and effectively to protect children, while remaining mindful of the risks involved. As a quick note, uh, today's session will be graphically recorded by Sketch Group, and the visual summaries will be available for you to share with your networks afterwards. Uh, we encourage you to help spread the word, um, and, and this is an important message that needs to be heard far and wide. Now, uh, before we dive in as well, I want to provide a content warning. Our discussion today will touch on sensitive topics such as online abuse, uh, grooming and exploitation. And we understand that these issues can be confronting. So please feel free to step away or take breaks as needed. It's not a sign of disrespect at all. Your well-being is our priority. And if any, at any point you feel distressed or, or need support, we've placed links to helpful resources in the chat, courtesy of NAPCAN. Additionally, we also have team members uh, working behind the scenes who are available to assist you should you need someone to reach out to. So it's there. So if you need it, please use it. It's important. I just want to thank everyone again. We have a big group today for joining us and uh, for your dedication to improving uh, child protection and family support. We look forward to an insightful and meaningful discussion with you all today. Now, uh, let's kick things off by introducing our incredible panel of experts, each bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience to this important discussion. Uh, each panelist will introduce themselves now, and I'll start off with Ash Ashley Katz, who is the Director of Child Protection uh, International Partnerships at the Attorney General's Department of Australia. Go ahead, Kat. Ash. Thanks, Harrison. <laughs> thanks uh, for the introduction, and thanks so much to NAPCAM for having me here today. Um, so I'm a director in the National Office for Child Safety in the Attorney General's Department, um, and I focus primarily 
on online child sexual exploitation and abuse um, and working with industry and importantly with our international partners and other governments around the world um, to tackle that is issue. So thanks so much. Phenomenal work. Uh, now I'll pass over to Lauren Elston, who is the Senior Education Advisor for Children, Youth and Families at the eSafety. Thanks, Harrison. Um, great to be here with everyone today. Uh, eSafety is Australia's independent regulator, educator and national coordinator for online safety. We've got a number of roles and functions that enable us to safeguard Australians online, including our research, education, training and our reporting schemes. And our primary goal is really the rapid removal of content and alleviation of harm. The Children, Youth and Families team I'm a part of develops guidance and resources for children and young people from age zero up to 25, as well as the parents, carers and trusted adults in their lives. Um, in particular, I lead a project that supports parents and carers to protect their children from child sexual abuse online. Fantastic. Thank you, Lauren. I'll now hand over to Lucy Thomas, OAM, the co-founder of Project Rocket, uh, who are known for their inspiring work in youth-led online safety and empowerment. Over to you, Liz. Oh, wow. Well, I better be better put my most inspiring um, hat on today. <laughs> um, my name is Lucy. Um, I use they, them and she, her pronouns. I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country, so I also want to acknowledge elders past and present and extend the respect to any mob who are joining us today. Big love. And I also just quickly want to acknowledge uh, survivors uh, in the room and advocates and the power of lived experience in these spaces. I know that weeks like this can be powerful and exhausting. So I hope that it fills, fills everyone's cup today. Um, yeah, I'm co-founder and CEO of Project Rocket. We're Australia's youth-driven movement against bullying, hate and prejudice. And despite the weight of those issues, I uh, have a really positive time out in schools all over Australia, working with thousands of teens every year. So. I think that's the inspiring part is the young people themselves. A hundred percent. Thank you, Lucy. And uh, finally, but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Kate Sim, who is the Director of Child Safety and Technology at the University of Western Australia's uh, Tech and Policy Lab. I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Sim. Hi, everyone. Um, it's such an honor to be joining you during this um, really exciting week. Um, like Harrison said, I am the incoming research Program Director at the University of Western Australia Law School's Tech and Policy Lab. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, where I'll be focusing on sort of the intersection of uh, child online rights and safety and privacy. Um, prior to coming into this role, I have about 14 years of experience in sexual violence prevention and response, where I've worked across community organizing, frontline support, government, academia, and industry in the US, UK, and South Korea. Um, I'm particularly interested in examining the role of technology um, in and sort of the role that it plays in solving structural violence issues that women and children experience. So really honored to be joining you all today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Dr. Sim. As I said, it's um, an incredible uh, panel of experts that we have here today, and, and each of you bring an immense wealth of knowledge and experience this important discussion. So thank you all for being here. It's, it's really is an honor. Uh, let's dive into the first part of our panel, uh, where we'll explore how artificial intelligence and emerging technologies are reshaping uh, child protection efforts. Um, we'll look at how these advancements can help us identify vulnerable children, uh, simplify reporting systems, and improve response times. Uh, we understand that AI can seem complex, so we'll break it down in a way that's easy to follow. Um, our aim is to give everyone here today a clear understanding of how these tools function and, and how they can be leveraged to effectively protect children. Um, Lauren, I was hoping to start with you. We know that the eSafety Commission is quick to remove online illegal content, including child sexual abuse material. What anticipated measures are in place to prevent the misuse of AI and emerging technology in new ways that could harm young people to be further exploited. Thanks, Harrison. Um, first, I just want to quickly touch on some of the risks that we're seeing at eSafety with technology such as AI before talking about the measures we can put in place. So like with any technology, it's important to remember that there are both risks and benefits, and we know that gen AI um, is here to stay. A lot of people are using Gen AI in very positive ways, and that's reflected in their attitudes towards it. So families, for example, are embracing this new technology to make their life easier. And it's really helping them with things like cooking, to travel planning, and, and even parenting. So 
So that families can make the most GNAI, it is really important to have the right safeguards in place, particularly for protecting children. So it's just like any other activity where we need to be safe, like riding a bike. We help environment for them by making sure they have a helmet and the skills to avoid obstacles. And in the online environment, things like printer controls are like the helmet and education around online risks such as misinformation and grooming provides the skills that help children and young people to avoid those dangers online. So we really do encourage parents and carers to be aware of what children are doing online and, and help keep them safe because often emerging technologies lack those inbuilt safeguards. So the low cost of these powerful digital tools makes it easier for bad actors to create and distribute and consume that harmful material. So that could include content that has a negative impact on wellbeing, like misogynistic, harmful or extremist content. Um, and it can also be used to automatically produce text that can be used to groom or sexually abuse children or, or radicalise them even to extreme views or ideology. So the most harmful uses of Gen I include the production of sexualised deep fakes and highly realistic child sexual abuse material using nudify type applications. And these apps can take images of real children and manipulate these images to create sexual depictions of them. It's really important to note that the original images don't need to be nude or sexual. They can be the kind of content any parent might feel comfortable sharing on social media. So the fact that these sexual images are synthetic doesn't make them any less harmful. Um, while Gen I can be used to create harmful content at scale, it can also cause harm in more passive ways through recommender systems and content moderation algorithms. And these algorithms combined with other features like endless scroll on, on many social media platforms are really designed to keep users and especially young people engaged. And this can be really harmful to their mental health, particularly when those recommender systems continually keep pushing out that harmful and negative content. So, I mean, that all sounds a little bit scary, but there are things that we can do. Um, the Online Safety Act already provides a mandate to safeguard Australians from the risk of emerging technologies like Gen AI. Um, our legislation provides for mandatory industry codes or standards covering eight sections of the online industry and includes Gen AI services. So the codes and standards lay down a set of legally enforceable compliance measures uh, that reduce the risk of illegal and restricted material circulating. And thanks to these codes and standards, the public will also be empowered to report companies that are not complying with the standards. In view of the, the rapidly evolving technical landscape, the standards take a technology neutral approach to implementation. So they identify outcomes rather than prescribing a technology to be used um, and ensure that proportionate obligations are in place across technology ecosystems. Um, yet we recognise the unique online safety risks from Gen AI, which is why our draft designated internet service standard, which is one that was registered in June this year, um, proposed very specific obligations on the platforms which distribute open source models and also on the highest risk, highest, highest risk, it's a mouthful this morning, consumer facing Gen AI services. Um, and so these draft standards proposed really do require those platforms to have and enforce appropriate terms of use um, to action and respond to user reports in addition to specific interventions on Gen AI. So, I think it's important to note that Gen AI can also be a part of the solution to these issues. The, the online industry can take a, a lead role in this by adapt, adopting a safety by design approach, which is built on three principles, service provider responsibility, user empowerment and autonomy, and transparency and accountability. So technology companies should also be aware of the expectations that apply to them under the new basic online safety expectations determination, which includes the expectation that end user safety is considered in the design and operation of Gen AI. And our transparency powers under the basic online safety expectations allows us to require services to report on the steps they are taking to meet the expectations. And that enables us to request information on how AI enabled features affect online safety on a service. And that technology companies not only have a clear pathway forward, but are compelled to play an active role in online safety solutions. So, um, I'd like to conclude by, by saying there is much more that Gen AI services can and should be doing in this space to safeguard the rights of users 
kids, especially children, um, while still preserving the, you know, the benefits of new, new tools and fostering that healthy innovation as well. Thanks, Lauren. Some incredible insights there. And, and you're right, that our parents and, and, and kids and, and society at large, they're up against these conglomerates of technology. And the eSafety Commission does some really fantastic work at keeping the finger on the pulse and ensuring that they're held accountable. And, and there's some great work up in it. I, I keep a very close eye on it. So thank you. Um, Ash, Ashley, I was hoping to hand over to you. The National Office for Child Safety has reached, recently launched a new campaign, um, the One Talk at a Time campaign, as well as a documentary, uh, The Shadows of the of the Web, Protecting Our Children in the in the Digital World is fantastic. If anyone hasn't seen it, I really encourage you to go watch it. Um, but both of these things are aiming to prevent child sexual abuse by encouraging adults to learn about the issues and have uh, ongoing conversations with children and young people. So what future challenges do you foresee artificial intelligence and emerging technologies having on child safety and, and how is your campaign preparing to adapt the, to these challenges as technology continues to evolve? Yeah, thanks, Harrison. And a, <clears throat> a really good question um, as we work through things, technology is changing all the time. So we need to be um, sure that we're, that we're keeping ahead of the game and we're not being left behind. Um, and what we do is relevant and current and therefore helpful. So we know that technologies like generative AI and internet encryption and things have introduced this complex set of challenges, particularly for law enforcement um, and government as we try and tackle this issue as it's still evolving. Um, we know that there's other technologies that we keep our eye on that we don't know whether they will or won't um, have that massive Im impact and you know, things like extended reality and the metaverse we've been talking about for a long time and they've existed for a long time. So we still need to be watching all those things um, and see how they evolve and how they transpire. Um, in the Gen AI space, you know, for law enforcement, um, we're already seeing those impacts. Um, so it's not emerging, it's here and it's now. And um, as Lauren already touched on, um, you know, sort of mass production of, of AI is a real risk, um, but also do our current prevention detection methods um, really uh, work when it's generative AI material? Um, as a legislation fit for purpose when we have sort of new types of material. Um, luckily in Australia and a lot of our like-minded it, it is and it still captures it, it's still child abuse material. Um, and also for our um, officers on the front line that are trying to identify victims in images, um, there's real concern around how do we know whether this is a real child, is it a modified image, is there a child that we need to rescue behind that? So um, we're very attuned to what those risks are and because of that it's important I think our communications and particularly the campaign um, was uh, was effective despite the technology that's used to perpetrate the kind the crime type. So there's some fundamental similarities and key messages, I think, in the prevention space, regardless of how offenders use technology to perpetrate these crimes. Um, and they're the messages that we really need to get through. So we talk about technology neutral, so not specifying you know this technology or that, but the outcome is you know a child is being is being harmed or at risk, and that's what we need to address. So the one talk at a time campaign. And that you refer to as a measure under Australia's national strategy to prevent and respond to child sexual abuse. Um, and that campaign is a sort of generational campaign. It's, it's here for longevity and it's about child abuse in all settings and aims to protect children and young people from sexual abuse. It's really about helping adults understand that it's preventable. There is something we can do. Um, you know, it sounds pretty discouraging when we talk about it sometimes, but we have to encourage people that there are efforts that can be made. So we have to have those really ongoing, proactive and preventative conversations with people, children and young people in their lives. And we've got to focus on those messages because it doesn't matter how that crime occurred, what technology was used or how it was facilitated. Um, we want children and young people to talk to adults in their lives if something's happening. Um, and that's really important. And the campaign was based on some really good research. I, I think that um, was able to show that we need to build that gradual awareness because it really isn't necessarily there. Um, it's not a subject anybody wants to talk about outside of our sector, um, understandably so. So we need to find a way that we can raise that awareness without um, people switching off and not listening and not hearing it. Um, so having those conversations. Um, and what we can do is the resources and tools that sit alongside the campaign that can be found um, on the website, childsafety.gov.au. They're being adapted and developed all the time to be more directed on certain technological um, development. So when sex extortion um, began to rise, we can we can really focus resources um, that people can turn to alongside the campaign. And we work closely with eSafety and our law enforcement colleagues at the ACE 
and to make sure that all of our messaging and all our resources are complementary that and you know we're all helping people and telling them the same thing and giving them the tools um, and that they the community can then understand what the challenges are and it's not overwhelming when you hear about all these different types of technologies um, and then following on from the campaign was the documentary which was um, you know something quite different it's as you say it's a 45 minute documentary called the shadows of the web and um, it's available on the childsafety.gov.au website um, and on youtube um, it's just been released and that's a really one-off thing that um, looks at the role um, of tech companies in this space uh, australia's holistic response you know it's got some positives we have amazing law enforcement we have powers under the e-safety commission you know we're pretty lucky here in australia um, but there's still big gaps um, that we need to fill and then it also complements the campaign um, messaging because um, whilst it's a different way of communicating and it's quite direct in the documentary and we you know it looks at sextortion as a particular crime type um, that's happening now um, and um, and that's detailed through some stories um, in the in the documentary the messaging is still the same that we want children to come to us and talk and speak and we want to make sure that they feel that they can um, and they don't need to Nobody needs to understand the technology that's sat behind all this to be able to say there's something not right um, or there's something I'm uncomfortable with. Um, and you need to make sure that you're having those ongoing conversations. It's part of our, as parents, it should be part of our everyday narrative with our kids in the same as safety outside um, on the street would be. So um, so the documentaries out there, um, we hope as many people as possible will get their eyes on it. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a different way that parents and, and carers and teens you know particularly can get information and understand what is happening what the current threats are um, and what some of those technologies mean um, so yeah thanks thanks Ashley you hit the nail on the head there and I want to say as well um, that documentary I really again just urge everyone to check it out and I was actually fortunate enough to to uh, attend the youth summit with the National Office for Child Safety and I I know firsthand that that team there is is fair to they want to see change they're, they're there to listen they're there to get the job done so i know firsthand it's it's a good group that you guys have there so thank you for your work um i want to hand it over to to you dr dr sim um the question i have here is how, how does the public perception of ai and emerging technologies influence the adoption and success of these adapting of, of adopting these tools into child protection yeah, um, public perception has tremendous impact on approaches to safeguarding young people, and it should because child safety is an issue that involves all of us um, as young people directly themselves and all of us as responsible adults who play some kind of role in young people's lives. So, of course, it should play a big big role. Um, at the same time, I think there's a steering of a conversation and there's an assumption that there should be a technological solution to this age old problem of safeguarding young people. And I think that's the area where at the tech and policy lab, we're raising a bit of an eyebrow um, because we're sort of assuming that there should be a role for um, technological solutions. Um, I'm sure like many of you who've been using, you know, we've had generative AI tools kind of thrusted in our user experiences the past year. Um, you know, I remember using LinkedIn and having to get all of these prompts that sound like, you know, they're clearly bot generated. Um, there are clearly some incredible uses um, coming as a result of the innovation, but I think like many people, our day-to-day -day experiences with these new technologies that we didn't sign up for um, is that they're, you know, kind of useless, to be completely frank. Um, so I want to be really critical about when we're thinking about technological solutions to this problem, which again, it's uh, safeguarding young people is an age-old problem. Um, if it is something that can be fixed with one kind of technological magic wand, then we, you know, would have solved it already. So I, I want to challenge those of us in this space to be really critical about what kind of technological solution are we thinking about and what exactly are the child safety issues that we're trying to um, address. Um, so in kind of thinking about technological solutions that are being touted in public spaces, um, I want to call out a few, particularly around age verification, social media bans, um, and device level scanning. All of these take a very blunt, big sweeping technological approach to fix a very complicated, sensitive social problem that preceded technological innovations and will continue, fortunately, to exist because they require all of us to work on it together at a structural level. 
Um, and I think part of the reason why we keep relying on these um, fixes or we think that, you know, creating a, um, a age verification system is going to be a quick um, solution to preventing young people from interacting with graphic material is that we still hold on to this idea that technology is objective, that it's certain and that it's clear. So to this messy problem, um, we want to see a quick kind of fix. Um, but this kind of narrative, I think, um, uh, presents a, a faulty narrative about technologies because actually they're quite prone to error and sometimes not even technically feasible. So for example, um, you know, let's look at a problem like age verification. Um, age verification is essentially a form of facial recognition technology. Um, you know, we have, uh, at least in the, uh, in, in the U.S., we have very, very little protection for young people's private information. Um, but we are going to be relying on this mass sweeping facial recognition system that is known to have low accuracy for darker skin tones and also to have low accuracy for boys and also for people with gender diverse bodies. And we're going to be asking for this tool to be used to gatekeep who has access to social media platforms and other online spaces that are integral to how young people are participating in their world. Um, I'm kind of going back to the metaphor that uh, Lauren raised earlier about using the bike helmet. Uh, you know, we a helmet offers a layer of protection, but we still keep the bike, right? We still let young people, you know, if you want to roll down the hill with your bike, it's dangerous can't stop you, but wear a helmet and be with friends and make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, but we don't take the bike away. But with a system like age verification, to me, the metaphorical kind of extension is actually taking the bike away altogether through this very faulty error prone system. Um, so I want all of us who are working in this space of empowering and safeguarding young people to be critical about what we're asking for these technological systems that are often run by private companies that are known to um, be monetizing our personal information and not necessarily have young people's best interest um, to take ownership of how our young people experience their digital lives. Um, and, you know, part of your question also said that, uh, you know, how do public perception impact the success of these tools? Uh, I think in many ways we're setting them up for failure. Like I said, um, we are asking them to fix a big, complicated, messy social problem. Um, and one big technological sweep is not going to solve that. Um, it also creates, um, you know, incentivizes risky behavior on young people as well. You know, think about the social media ban. I'm familiar that Australia, there's been a really heated conversation um, about social media ban. Um, but again, this is where young people are hanging out. Um, and there are legitimate concerning design issues that we really need to hold big tech accountable. For example, features like social mapping that connect minors to random people on the internet is a clearly you know, monetizing feature that we really need to hold companies like Meta accountable. But for most young people, social media is how they talk to each other, is how they hang out, um, especially in this time of ongoing pandemic when young people don't have access to libraries and social spaces, playgrounds, this pro, you know, provides a really vibrant opportunity for young people to live their lives, um, however messy and risky and complicated it may be. Um, so I really wanna uh, kind of go back to this question about, of course, public perception plays a big role because we all care about this issue. Um, but I think we often let tech companies decide what those narratives are. And we, again, as caring adults and responsible adults in young people's lives, have a real opportunity here to be critical and push back against this idea that one technological solution is going to be solving this complicated problem. A hundred percent, Dr. Sim. We can't we can't apply a very simple solution to a, a as you said a messy and complicated issue. It requires nuance and a lot of understanding. Um, thank you for that, Dr. Sim. Touched on young people as well, and and Project Rocket has actually engaged directly with young people across the nation. Um, Lucy, what are some of your insights, or, or what are you hearing from from young people about emerging technologies and AI, especially in relation? Uh, to the rise of, of child abuse and, and neglect? 
Yeah, well, uh, I guess as, as you've named, we work primarily with uh, young people around peer-based issues, exploring themes like cyberbullying and discrimination, building inclusive communities at school and online, um, looking at, you know, support mechanisms through, through digital media. Um, and so, of course, it makes sense to catch my comments in young people's social online experiences. And of course, uh, exploitation in these spaces is a very significant concern. I will first name, though, that when we think about online safety as adults, the issues that are top of mind are vastly different to those that concern young people um, in, from their own perspectives. And I, I just want to cite a reference here that in 2022, Project Rocket embarked on a co-research project with the Young and Resilient team at Western Sydney University, actually funded by eSafety. So thanks, Lauren, I'll, I'll attribute that one to you. Um, I actually designed, the whole project was around reimagining online safety through the eyes of young people. We pulled together a co-research team that included young people and academics at the, at the university and explored, first of all, what are young people learning about online safety through school? Um, and what would they like to be learning? What are they actually experiencing in terms of the, their top concerns and harms? What we discovered was that, you know, as adults, we tend to centre extreme risks for, for good reason. We see the, the extreme impacts of those risks, things like grooming, privacy violations, exploitation, extreme cyberbullying that leads to some devastating uh, mental mental health outcomes. What young people revealed they were really concerned about were these lower level, more everyday concerns. You know, things like uh, navigating communication online, friendships and connection, consent was a really significant one, and, and holding and asserting boundaries. Some of these kind of actually more more um, eternal challenges of adolescence that we're trying to work out, how to how to connect and find belonging what was really interesting, though, is that the education that young people are largely receiving in school goes straight to these extreme risks. And, you know, we, we were discovering that as a result, we're not actually building young people's critical capabilities, that while these issues might have less dire impacts to us as adults, they're really important stepping stones to supporting young people to deal with these more significant harms that we, we're all concerned about. Um, and so, you know, moving to the conversation around AI, well, AI is you know, already deeply embedded in young people's online worlds. And we tend to talk about this umbrella term of AI not making the differentiation between different types. You know, that generative AI um, is, is a really significant part of the equation to traditional AI, which isn't really new and isn't really nascent technology. Um, so the distinction being that traditional AI methods rely on those, you know, rules and patterns. It's that kind of machine-based learning um, and we're very limited ability to kind of like think outside the box. Um, whereas in contrast, I think some of the, the developments that we're talking about here and what we're really trying to refer to is this generative AI that, you know, can really create novel ideas and um, deviate from these existing patterns in some ways in, in really exciting ways. And of course, yeah, in some ways it's just like really random and concerning and dark, some of the places that these, these kind of, uh, machine machines can take us. So yeah, for years, digital platforms have used machine learning to power content recommendation systems. And so that when we go on Netflix, we're not just flooded with every TV show that's ever been released, that actually they can serve as content matched to our interests. That, you know, we're seeing social media platforms that are proactively detecting and removing harmful content. I think I, I was looking at um, Instagram's latest transparency report and saw that over 96% of bullying com complaints are content is removed before it's reported these days, uh, which probably gives you an indication of how the volume of content that's out there because young people are still seeing it. You know, we're seeing that platforms are striving increasingly to create age appropriate experiences using some of these signals and the way that they can adapt those based on user preferences, you know, things around advertising as well. We do need to consider how young people themselves are utilising AI, uh, sometimes really positively and sometimes in harmful ways. I think we have a tendency with anything that has, you know, two sides to it to say there are some good sides and then let's focus on the bad sides. Um, however, in these spaces, often they're co-occurring. You know, we know that the positives and the negatives are inextricably bound and that it's quite difficult to protect young people without cutting off their access entirely. There was, of course, the the well-publicised case in Victoria where male students used AI to create deep fake nudes of female peers. And I think um, for a lot of us, it was probably only a matter of time before seeing something like that happen, which I think is part of, part of the devastation of this these emerging technologies that 
you know, the writing's on the wall. We can see where the harms are, are, are going to fall. And then, you know, it's really, it's a really horrifying experience as adults and professionals in the space to be waiting for some team to take matters into their own hands and, and make this happen. So, but I think that what really this incident underscores is how access to these emerging technologies can, you know, amplify existing forms of abuse, such as misogyny, racism, homophobia. Um, it's not a problem created by technology. Uh, as you know, we know the undercurrent of misogyny in post-colonial Australia certainly predates the internet. However, I think we need to really examine how both generative and traditional AI, um, such as social media algorithms, are shaping young people's online experiences. And at the moment, Project Rocket's working on a co-research project exploring young people's experiences of what they call the algorithm. When they say the algorithm, they're actually talking about many algorithms that intersect to give them a seamless scroll or experience of their newsfeed. But uh, we just surveyed over a thousand 12 to 20 year olds. And while the report is yet to be released, we're seeing that machine learning is shaping their online experiences in both positive and negative ways. As I said, often simultaneously, there are positives. We found that a vast majority, I think it was about 80% reported that social media algorithms are delivering them content that they find useful, helpful. Many shared stories about um, how literate they are around how algorithms work and that they're actively using recommendation systems to access new communities, news and politics to build new skills, to access diverse perspectives, uh, much more so than those that we all grew up with. And indeed, accessing vital support that they're unable to find elsewhere. Um, and Uh, actually only just over half reported that they've received content that they found offensive or inappropriate. In some cases, it's really violent, deeply disturbing, sexually explicit content. Um, and, you know, the, the issue here is that they felt stuck and hooked into this endless scroll that Lauren mentioned that happens when you're delivered a, a continuous feed of content that anticipates your very wants and needs. So. I just want to name the complexity here. And unfortunately, if we continue to host public discourse um, that precludes young people and excludes their lived experience, we're not going to get to the heart of the matter. hundred percent, Lucy. Um, thank you all for those very insightful contributions. It's clear that there are some uh, very obvious challenges in child protection, but there are also some incredible opportunities ahead of us. Um, this brings us to an exciting area of focus in our talk today, how we can harness AI and emerging technologies to proactively prevent harm and enhance child protection efforts. So uh, now we're gonna shift gears and, and dive into the practical side, uh, looking at the strategies and, and actions being taken to integrate AI into prevention and, and protection efforts uh, from identifying at-risk children to improving response times. These tools really do have the, prevent, uh, the potential uh, to transform how we safeguard young people in, the, in a digital world. So uh, let's start unpacking this with our, our panelists and hear more about how AI is shaping the future of child protection. Ashley, I wanted to start with you. Beyond AI, uh, what emerging technologies do you foresee uh, playing a significant role in, in child abuse prevention and protection. Yeah, thanks, Harrison. Um, it's interesting, we still, we still do refer to emerging technologies and, and we don't know what the future holds because the space moves so fast. So um, I think it's important that we kind of look up, look at the technologies that are around now, but they can be changed in how they're used. Um, and uh, as we've already touched on, AI has been around a long time. But generative AI is a is a new way of it being used in the sort of child protection space, um, and it's important that we keep an eye on those things um, as government, as law enforcement um, in our space, particularly um, because we know um, the technologies adopted early um, 
particularly by offenders, um, and that we want to make sure we're ahead of that. And we're also being early adopters of technology, uh, particularly when it comes to our law enforcement colleagues and the criminal justice process. So we want to make sure that we are always sort of horizon scanning and looking ahead and saying how can the technology that we think might be adapted, um, unfortunately, um, to supercharge some of this offender behaviour might also be something that we can use. Um, and there's certainly opportunities for this. Um, in our law enforcement space, when we talk about large volumes, of you know child abuse material um online well our law enforcement colleagues have to go through those as the e safety and hotlines and things and and ai um is a is a tool as will other technologies be and how we can um sift through those quicker how we can reduce the exposure um to some of our frontline services um around that online material um and then in the prevention space i think um, it's important that we're always working uh, with tech companies and i think as as government um we're trying to do that more and more. We're trying to share that um, the information we have and what we know um, and find ways to incentivize them um, to use, utilize the development and the resources that they have as tech companies um, for good as well as, um, as well as for the deployment of the services um, that in some cases are facilitating it. So um, looking at um, some of those newer technologies, absolutely in the prevention space. Um, but I think it's also about technologies have been around for a long time. They can just be used differently um, and it might be, that um, that a technology company has just deployed things differently and therefore our prevention method needs to change um, and how offenders might be using those technologies has changed. Um, virtual reality gaming has been around a long, long time um, and there's been some great prevention technology already in place around that. But as soon as you start to add on different services and options um, for kids in that, then the risk changes. Um, and so our prevention method should change and we should utilize the same thing. You know, if kids are using those chat functions and chatbots more than so should our prevention um, methods also um, look at that. So I think um, for us, it's about supporting um, industry and tech companies um, to be able to, to do those things with us and for us um, and for us to be able to harness them as well, make sure we have the right legislation around it so that we can do that um, and make sure that all our uh, sort of protection and prevention strategies um, remain effective over time as technology is changing. So, you know, thinking about virtual reality, um, you know, there, there's a fear that we'll sort of not be able to see what kids are doing online. But we know from research that a lot of parents and carers don't know in their home what their kids are doing online anyway, and um, they're in another room. So the same kind of prevention methods uh, really apply, even though the technology might change. And I think um, that goes back to then you know, the sort of conversations that we're having with, with young people and, and understanding the way they're using things and, and how they're interacting um, online so that we can adapt those prevention um, conversations and methods. Um, because, you know, whatever the technology is, it's, it's, it's the same outcome and some of those key messages um, still hang, still ring true. Thanks. 100%. This is something that's ever evolving and, and constantly changing and staying on the front foot of that is it, it, it is a it is a, a difficult task. But that collaboration with big tech and, and industry is so important, which actually uh, leads me into my next question, which is for Lauren, how, how important are those partnerships between uh, technology f firms and, and non profits and, and governmental agencies and other stakeholders in advancing? Uh, AI driven child protection initiatives. Could you maybe provide some examples of, of successful collaborations that you've seen? Absolutely. And I think Ashley touched on a, a lot of the points I'm probably going to touch on too. And I, I really want to frame my response around the idea of like harnessing all those positives um, whilst we engineer out those harms, and that includes child sexual abuse. And in order to do that, it really does require a whole of society response. So we know that when technology is used for sexual abuse or bullying or harassment, um, it really can amplify the harm that's felt by the victim. And that public, sh the public sharing of abuse material and that always on sort of nature of technology can really make it feel like the abuse is, is hard to escape from. So digital technologies can also create new ways for harm to occur, like with, with Gen AI, for example. So online safety really does require that coordinated and collaborative global effort um, by law enforcement agencies, regulators, NGOs, educators, community groups, um, and the tech industry itself. And so we've seen some great collaboration between industry and two US 
Thorn and All Tech is Human uh, to create safety by design Gen AI principles to protect children. And these principles include scanning for abusive content, removing child sexual abuse material from training model data, and preventing the creation of AI models that are harmful or that promote the creation of CSAM. So industry participants, including Amazon, Meta, Microsoft, and OpenAI, open have committed to guarding against the production and dissemination of AI-generated CSAM and, and other sexual harms against children. And as part of those commitments, these participating companies have voluntarily agreed to release ongoing progress updates. So this is very encouraging at this at this stage. Um, AI can also be part of the solution and it's been used for many years as we've, we've said to, to support content moderation efforts at scale and some of those tools like Google's Content Safety API are, are offered to qualifying partners free of charge and this API uses AI, a lot of acronyms in this, <laughs> to classify and prior the priority that's given by a classifier the more likely the image contains material and that can then really help those platforms prioritize their human view elements and and make their own determination of the content so the AI there is is um, improving the efficiency of of the review process and so earlier this year um, ESAD provided evidence to the Senate Standing Committee on legal and constitutional affairs around amending the criminal code to include deep fakes and work um, and we're also pursuing effective prevention and protection and proactive efforts to tackle these challenges as well. So that includes under the, the new basic online safety expectation determination I mentioned earlier, um, including the expectation that end user safety is considered in the design and operation of Gen AI. Um, we're a member of the Global Online Safety Regulatory Network working internationally regulatory coherence um, and sharing insights and we've also co-signed the, the European Commission Statement of Cooperation on Children's Safety and Rights with a focus on new threats raised by emerging technologies including AI generated CSAM. Um, locally as, as Lucy mentioned we're supporting organisations through our online safety grants program. Um, so organisations like the University of Tasmania and Deakin to explore the benefits of online safety education interventions that utilise AI. So, for example, the, the Uni of Tasmania are creating and providing a chatbot to support adolescents in dealing with cyberbullying, grooming and, and image-based abuse. Um, also, at eSafety, we, we talk a lot with parents and carers and the organisations who support them to, to better understand their needs and what, we, and what sort of trusted advice we provide them with. And we really want them to feel confident Confident to be able to guide children that support their well-being and tell someone if they experience that online abuse, particularly sexual abuse. Um, we know that young people often feel guilt, shame, or embarrassment when they experience online harm. But we also know that staying, style, staying, staying silent about these online abuses really does increase the risk of harm, as well as that ongoing distress and trauma to the child. So we really want to reduce the stigma associated with talking about these online harms and, and help empower parents and carers and trusted adults to really provide the right kind of supports for children. So our team's been working with children and young people's support networks, um, including their families and local community and services, to really let young people know they have the right to feel safe and to participate online and that experiencing online abuse is not their fault. That we also work with partners across community organisations organisations to support parents and carers and, and helping them to understand the impact of online abuse, how to talk to their children about you know, their rights online and consent and things like that, um, how to engage with and supervise children in age appropriate ways, also how to help them get content taken down if they do experience image-based abuse or, or serious cyberbullying. So, while that uh, focus on protection and prevention of harm is vital, it's also important to focus on rights in space and by helping children understand their right to a safe enjoyment of the online world and you know, participating fully in all its opportunities. Um, parents and carers can, can support them to really recognise early when something isn't right um, and to seek help. Um, under the National Strategy to Prevent and Respond child sexual abuse and supporting the work of the National Office for Child Safety in their One Talk at a Time campaign. Um, 
we launched early this week, for example, a suite of online safety resources for parents and carers. And I'm going to do a shameless plug here to go check out those resources at esafety.gov.au slash parents. Um, but they really do include practical tips for keeping children safe on games, apps and social media. And they're giving parents and carers really practical tools like conversation starters to have those age appropriate conversations about potential harms, including child sexual um, we also work quite closely with the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation and, and other key support services to ensure that if something does go wrong, it's very easy for parents and carers to know what support they can get from the police. Um, our air safety can help with getting content taken down. So, like the question asked, I think like collaboration and partnership are really key. Um, and AI focused child protection initiatives are one part of the bridge puzzle. It's important to note that we can't arrest our way out of these challenges. Um, and indeed a lot of the victim survivors that come to us through our complaint schemes really just want the imagery taken down rather than pursuing a criminal justice pathway. So um, we can't we also can't just regulate our way out of these harms. It's it's only by having that sort of multifaceted approach that we can really tackle these um, rapidly relating AI generated harms. One hundred percent, Lauren. Uh, what you illustrated there, you provided some great examples of, of how collaboration really is the key to success here, um, and and providing practical and, and effective solutions. It, it's really critical. Um, Lucy, I I wanted to ask you, how do we address this sort of ethical dilemma of using AI in environments where it might inadvertently infringe on the autonomy or rights of vulnerable children or, or families. It's it's a tricky space to navigate. So how do we weigh up the the benefits of AI intervention against the risks of, of potential overreach or harm? Yeah, I think, yeah, as we know, AI and in particular machine learning um, helps to create more curated and safer online experiences and environments, but also obviously introduces some complex ethical dilemmas. I think we're all grappling with that. Um, and, you know, as part of my role at Project Rocket, I'm lucky to sit on some global advisories of social media platforms like Meta um, and Snapchat and I'm hearing in real time. It's really fascinating to be in the room where you're hearing product engineers and safety policy people thrash out some of these challenges and where to draw a line, um, which is really difficult. So I can, I've just got a memo that my, my camera's off. Sorry about that. I don't know what's happened there. Um, but I think, yeah, as we know, um, one through these spaces, I've been able to observe that one really effective use of machine learning is around the circumvention of like predatory adults in children and, uh, and young people's online spaces that we know we don't necessarily see this widely in, in the general public, but platforms, of course, have community guidelines that prohibit a range of behaviours and sometimes there are issues with enforcement. But also, as we know, um, you know, these bad actors, predators are notorious for knowing how to skate incredibly close to the boundaries without crossing them in the, as part of their playbook. Um, and in many cases, tragically, it's so hard to demonstrate that an adult has nefarious intentions towards a child until it's too late. Um, you know, we have this like conundrum where we, that it's like they need to prove that, that their bad intent, um, which is just so, so tragic. And I think what machine learning can do in some contexts is anticipate signals um, that, that are really crucial. So for example, some platforms are now capturing these warning signs, like an adult contacting, spamming 50 young people that they don't have any common connections with, um, private messages. And that, that's a warning sign, obviously. And what machine learning can do is detect that and shut down that conversation or limit those into further interactions. Machine learning ensures that young people actually aren't able to be contacted in these ways in the first place. So, you know, these are some of the measures that are really powerful. But of course, one of the key tensions in using AI is balancing our privacy and agency and some of the nuance I think that was spoken about earlier. In this case, protection and participation. We know that, you know, children and young people's rights as delineated by the UN Convention's rights of the child can be grouped into three broad categories and protection is one of those categories. We've also got provision rights. So, you know, that children need to have access to, to certain things, a home, um, shelter, education, all of these kinds of things. 
Um, but also participation is recognised globally as an important um, dimension to young children and young people's rights. And so, yeah, on the one hand, I think, you know, we, we can talk about proposed social media bans for under 16s and, and, and obviously one of the key measures, one of the key tools for enforcing these, these bans would be um, AI, generative AI features to discern a user's age. Um, on the one hand, you know, age verification aims to keep young people safe by ensuring that they have age appropriate content or aren't allowed to access certain spaces at all. But, you know, a question for all of us, I think, is are these measures, um, you know, are they infringing on young people's participatory rights? Are they actually protecting them from the harms that they purport to be protecting? Are we creating um, further harms or secondary harms that we haven't anticipated? One of the things I, I'd love for us to see when we design solutions is actually to take a, a safety by design approach to, to policy as well as to product design. So to anticipate some of those unintended un unintended impacts. And I think that, you know, in the case of age verification, it's important to consider that there are really much broader ethical implications for all of us. If we were to decide today that young people under 16 aren't able to access social media, the reality of systems to actually enforce that um, create a whole heap of hurdles and challenges for a range of marginalised communities. Um, the non-AI approach is to have everyone um, prove their age via some government issued ID. And I think for those of us who, who have experienced marginalisation in a variety of forms can acknowledge that, that there's, that's, there's huge flaws in that. Um, the, the other key alternative that's being proposed is around uh, facial age recognition using AI, you know, kind of tools which would require capturing biometric data. And I think we probably have concerns about 13 year olds giving over their biometric data to global corporations uh, in perpetuity. So, you know, do we want young people to hand, have to hand over such sensitive information just to be able to access online spaces? And in fact, it'll be all of us that are subject to these, these you know, new, new regimes as well. So do we want every citizen to have to give over this information to participate in online spaces? I think finally a critical consideration is that young people, as was acknowledged at the very start, are inheriting an increasingly AI generated and driven world. We can't simply cut them off from these technologies in the name of protection. Doing so would limit their opportunities to thrive in a digital future, to, you know, actually innovate to solve some of the very entrenched issues environmentally and socially that they're, they're, they we've handed down to them generationally. And, and of course, you know, what we really need to focus on coming back to that conversation that I shared before is around building their literacy, their critical capabilities, um, to, to put them in positions where they are uh, the engineers and the ethicists who are determining how to use these AI tools safely, ethically, and of course, effectively. So I think it's about us shaping narratives that support safety and participation and giving people the, the skills to benefit from AI while safeguarding themselves from its potential harm rather than us just kind of coming in and engineering those solutions without them. 100%. There's a lot to unpack there, um, Lucy, and I'm sure there could probably be a panel just solely focused on that um, to unpack all the nuance, but you articulated that really, really perfectly, really. Um, Kate, I just wanted to hand over to you. Given the intersection of, of technology and, and child welfare and, and public policy, how, how do you envision uh, governance models that facilitate uh, that effective collaboration across those sectors? Yeah, um, I think it begins by asking the question of um, should there be a collaboration and what does effective collaboration look like? Um, so I want to highlight five learnings that I've gathered from my experience in front lines, working within industry um, and in academia and in uh, nonprofit sector as well. Um, the first question that I think actually Lucy early on addressed really well is what exactly is the problem that we're trying to address? Um, as she mentioned, um, extreme risks and day-to-day -day risks look very differently and they require different kinds of interventions from different actors. But I think when we're having these broad conversations about the role of technology in young people's lives, where it ranges from access to social media platforms to um, isolated and vulnerable young people, um, 
you know, matched with unknown um, adults on social media platforms. These are very different scenarios and we tend to collapse all of them. And it's actually doing us a disservice from engaging with what could be actually useful interventions here. Um, and of course, related to that is, you know, are we trying to, um, when we all assume that we're there to protect children, but it also requires you know, invites us to ask questions like what kind of protection and what kind of children. Um, we know that, um, you know, children with disability are one of the most um, likely to experience child sexual abuse because of their lack of physical and uh, mental health agency. And that's, um, we see similar dynamics playing out in online spaces where young people who are um, living with disability seek out communities um, and often without supervision or without um, thoughtful conversation from the adults around them. So we see the offline things that we know about structural ways that violence shape young people's lives playing out in digital spaces as well. Um, but we tend to loop all of these children together as you know the children on the internet, even though they have very different experiences. A toddler, um, you know, using YouTube Kids to watch Peppa Pigs to Kill Time is going to have very different um, issues that they're dealing with from 17 year old, um, you know, who is exploring intimacy and interested in non-consensual, uh, interested in generating imagery in a trusted consensual um, manner. So these things require us to be really rigorous about defining terms and being specific about exactly the kinds of issues that we're trying to address. Um, the second issue that I want to, or the second learning that I want to call out is that um, we really need to be principled in applying a rights-based approach to thinking about these issues. Uh, I want to call out two frameworks that I keep coming back to because I find them to be really um, uh, inspiring and also generative. One is the UN Convention on the Rights of Children, um, and it you know, has many, many, many rights that they call out, but I want to call out two in particular. One is the right to privacy. Um, I think when we're thinking about protection and thinking about safety, we have a tendency to wave off privacy um, as if it's some kind of a luxury that young people don't need. But actually privacy is integral to young people's development. It's how they realize that you have access to your own space, that you own your own body, and that you can make the life that you want to make. And privacy is integral. Um, but you know, when we're using, uh, again, technologies like uh, age verification that I think, again, Lucy, um, you know, just describe really um, helpfully around data minimization, right? When we're collecting all of this information, we're intruding on young people's privacy. Uh, we're intruding on young people's ability to, you know, live different lives throughout the course of their development. Uh, and related to that is the right to play. Um, play is such an integral part of young people. And I think because we're worried about safety, um, we forget that actually the kind of, you know, rich lives that we want young people to have is where they can play uh, and can be free. And I think we have a tendency to offset that because we're so concerned about protection. In a limited, uh, in a uh, related vein, um, I also draw heavily from transformative justice framework. Um, and the core principle with that is the understanding that violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. And this is a, true for child sexual abuse as well. Um, these Every incident is um, a political and a politicized act because we live in a world of great inequity and injustice. Um, and allowing young people to be messy in this messy world, they might not always act in the way that we would like them to, but that is what being a kid is, that is what being human is. And I think we have to be really true to holding on to those principles to, to guide our approaches. Um, the third learning that I want to highlight is um, being really evidence-based. Again, I've mentioned rigor before, uh, but it's really important that we be meticulous about understanding what is effective. There are so many things that we could do, and we have limited resources, so we have to really ask ourselves a question of what is actually going to be effective, what's going to pack a punch. Um, so for example, I think with child sexual abuse, there's increasingly, I mean, historically, the narrative has been the stranger danger narrative. And we're seeing, you know, a similar narrative coming around gaming platforms, which online, it certainly does happen. Um, but actually, research does show that 60%, um, uh, this was a meta study of uh, studies on uh, child sexual abuse that are both online and offline and actually online child sexual abuse mirrors what we see offline as well where it's committed by people who are known to young people 
and known in the sense that they might be playing games every day with this you know unknown person so i know that idea can seem like a stranger to um to, to guardians but to the child it's a known um individual so i want to i want to challenge us to you know um uh, to kind of abandon the stranger danger narrative um and see it from the young people's perspective of um what are the conditions in which they find themselves um in these uh, uh contexts and also you know research does increasingly show that child sexual abuse is um committed by older um children against younger children um, and this is an issue related to housing this is an issue related to bodily autonomy this is an issue related to um young people understanding self-determination um so you know one of the most effective tools that we see over and over and over again from clinical setting to advocates in the front line is the importance of sex education um, I know we're talking about generative AI and all of these emerging things, but actually, you know, good old sex education that, you know, isn't just about anatomical accuracy, but teaching young people how to talk about your body, how to talk about pleasure, how to talk about comfort, how to talk about consent. These are things that are going to give young people the tools to be able to make sense of the experience that they're undergoing. Uh, the fourth learning that I want to call out is um, the question around, do we have the right people at the table? Uh, when we're thinking about collaboration, should there be collaboration and who's at the table? The topic of child welfare is too important and we cannot let people who just have a fleeting interest or people without a track record who have, you know, uh, had a long standing experience in this space to make a decision. Um, I think child safety in particular has a history of having, you know, familiar faces. Um, with without uh kind of rigorous experience in this space so i really want to encourage the social workers on the front line child advocates researchers community advocates who are actually doing the day-to-day -day work with children and who can speak to the ways in which tech may play a role in their messy day-to-day -day lives to be at the forefront of making important policy decisions so that we know that they can actually be effective and be local and be specific um, and then finally, kind of to tie all of this up, um, you know, I think oftentimes we assume the protection is the thing that we want to do. And in doing so, we end up assuming the role of the caregiver or a parent. Um, but if we're looking at this as a system, uh, systemic issue, um, I want to I want to challenge all of us in this space to think about empowerment and think about agency. Um, our you know gut feeling especially if you're a parent is to kind of err on the side of protection because you know we want to be able to hold on and we want to be able to provide those safeguards um, but young people actually already come into the world knowing who they are um, and it's our job as trusted adults to be stewards and to provide them with the resources so that they can make an informed decision about who they want to be um, so rather than enclosing them and keeping things away from them I want to challenge us to think about how can we support them and provide them with the conditions so that they can go out into the world and be who they want to be. I, I want to say, Dr. Sim, uh, as a survivor of child sexual abuse and an advocate who, who really shares his story in, in a very public way, um, that was incredibly validating to hear. Um, it's so important that we you know, collaboration is key, especially with lived experience and, and people who present survival-led initiatives and, and solutions and, and have that insight because lived experience can't be replicated. Um, and it's important that we really acknowledge that. And we can't just solely listen to those ideas and solutions. We we have to have the courage to act upon them. So I think you really touched on that. Um, so thank you. Um, yeah, so now that we've heard from our panelists and, and how AI and, and technology are transforming, child protection we'd, we'd love to open the floor um, for a few questions to everyone who's tuning in this is a, a phenomenal opportunity to engage directly with our expert panel um, on these important topics that we've covered today um, we do we are short on time so we'll only have a couple of questions I've got some that are coming through here and I'll just uh, sort of open it to the floor if that's okay with everyone and, and anyone who wants to jump in is more than welcome to um, first one that we've got in here is what uh, strategies can be employed to engage affected communities in the decision-making process when implementing AI interventions in child welfare? Lucy, you're nodding your head. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm so passionate about this one. Um, 
so so the reason I'm so passionate about it is that Project Rocket um, was started as a youth driven community project. There was nothing, if there existed something out there to share our lived experience and as young people meaningfully shape the world, we would have happily slotted into that structure rather than having to learn how to operate a business and do GST, let me tell you. Um, but there wasn't. And so, you know, core to our DNA is engaging young people, elevating their perspectives, um, ensuring that young people are not only consulted, but hold the tools. And I'm just so passionate about this. So, yeah, I think to, to answer that question around how do we engage affected communities meaningfully in, you were saying, it, like it's in actively shaping the solutions, right, in, in decision making. Um, my first tip would be that it's a cent lived experience isn't a box tip tick or a nice to have. I think the mo world is moving in this direction where we honour it as powerful, as valid expertise, as the only way that we will, can create change on deeply ingrained challenges that we face. So that first suggestion would be around we need to honour lived experience. What that means is we're not um, feeding an, a predetermined narrative. Um, often we you know, the, the way we go about consultation projects is to kind of plan the outcome and run it by a select cohort of people with lived experience. Um, what we know is that that's incredibly leading um, and also can cause those communities to internalise the narrative that we're feeding them, which can be in some cases quite harmful um, and stigmatising. The next tip is that I think it's really important that we build the capacity. I'm going to speak specifically about young people. Um, so, you know, all of us are trying to get our heads around the way these nascent technologies work. And if we ask young people, what do you think or what should we do? They're only going to be able to speak from their, their, lived, their own individual lived experience. It's really important that we elevate their literacy around the structures and systems that they're working within, the limitations, um, the, the very nature of the technology and some of the nuances as compared to what they may have experienced in gaming or social media. Um, and so it's really important that we actually build their, equip them with the ability to meaningfully give feedback. I, I think the next tip I'd give is that we need to involve people from start to finish. I kind of mentioned this, but you know, often it, consultation will be seen as a box tick and we'll say, oh, we invited three young people at the end and they said it was okay, so it's got the thumbs up. Um, important to have that continuous involvement. And of course, you know, it, it, to in, in acknowledge that young people aren't a homogenous group. So we need to include diverse range of stakeholders within those communities, people with different perspectives. And a great example is that we tend to, when we talk about young people, we tend to homogenize an, an incredibly diverse part of the population by its age. Actually, you know, it's important that we take an intersectional approach and acknowledge that among young people, we also have survivors. Um, we have those with experience of mental ill health and recovery, those who are First Nations, those who are LGBTQIA+, who are culturally and faith diverse. And it's really important for many of us, those dimensions of our identities are just as important and just as critical to understanding our lived experience. So, yeah, I think it's about really honouring lived experience, building people's capacity, involving them from start to finish and honouring the, the very diversity that these communities bring as well. A hundred and ten percent. Does anyone have a brief uh, follow up? I, I, I just um, in conscious of time, uh, we're running quite short. But Ashley, did you have something that you want to follow up with? I was very brief. It's so, Lucy, that was amazing. I agree with all of that. Um, and I hope policymakers and people similar in my position have evolved somewhat um, over time and are doing exactly that. And I think other important really things are to think about who are impacted by what we do um, and how do we foster an environment where they feel like their consultation is worth their time and their effort because it, it comes at a personal cost, particularly when it's people with lived experience. Um, this, you know, it can't be a tick box. We can't just consult over and over. Um, and actually let's consult them at the very beginning. Even when we're talking about people who we know won't agree with what we have in mind and what we wanna do, it's important that we genuinely reach out to them early on um, and are prepared to change the way, the direction we're going on the basis of that. So yeah, thanks Lucy. 100%. Um, I, I feel really bad. We have to cut the Q&A session a, a little bit short because we are just uh, st stretched for time. But I, I, I really appreciate um, that. And, and as we come to the end of today's session, I, I want to extend my deepest thanks to everyone who joined and, 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 and uh, participated. It's, it's been an incredibly insightful and important conversation. And I'm so grateful for your participation. And, and on behalf of myself, the panelists, and, and Napcan, we we wouldn't be able to do this without um, without 
people being here and, and listening to us speak. So thank you for being here. Um, a special thank you to our amazing panelists as well, Kate, Lucy, Ashley, and Lauren. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise and, and for the work that you continue to do in, in advancing child protection uh, through the use of technology. Um, your insights today have been incredibly invaluable and it's clear we have so much to learn as we navigate this evolving digital landscape together. Um, before we wrap up, I, I would just like to remind everyone that, that a recording of this webinar will be made available within the next week or so. So if there's anything you want to revisit or, or share with your networks, you'll be able to access that very soon. Um, thank you again for everyone's engagement, uh, your commitment to protecting children and, and for being part of this um, essential conversation. And I really look forward to continuing this journey with each and every one of you. So thank you for being here today.